kind of do a very informal pass off and intro. Um, a lot of you on here know Erin, but um, a few things. She's, in, in addition to a filmmaker, she's a writer and editor um, and working in environmental history for a long time um, and interested obviously in, in, the, in the moving image and its intersections there, her films. Um, I'll just mention the highlights, been at full frame. There's the highlight, no. <laughs> and uh, New York Film Festival, um, Copenhagen, we could go on and on and take up a lot of time, which is not what we want to do. Um, a lot of experience and, and continued work in print journalism, including the editor in chief of uh, Natural History Magazine and a columnist. Um, I think the intersection of, of image and words, at least in her mind, not necessarily on the screen, um, is, is uh, one of the, the real abiding uh, gifts of Aaron's work. I had the pleasure of teaching with her in contemporary documentary film for a number of semesters. And, uh, and it was, you know, to, to be able to see somebody in the classroom is, is another whole layer of, uh, of understanding from even seeing work or, or being in class or being on the street. So um, I feel really lucky and it's just great to have you back, even though back is such a relative term in this term, back on the screen, I guess. Um, but it's great to have you anyway, we can have you here and next time it'll be in person, but right now it's in the Zoom box. So welcome Aaron and I'm gonna hand it off. Thanks so much, Tom. Um, well, I, I am thinking of you all in, in Durham or wherever, wherever this might be finding you right now. Obviously, digital conveyances really will never compete um, with the affectiveness of actually sharing a, a space together um, with the convergence of, of heartbeats and um, all the things that come with it. So that's the refrain number one of my, of my digital blues. I do wish I was there in person, but instead I'm here in Colorado in Boulder and I um, am actually sitting in front of some of Lisa McCarty's photographs right now at the University of Colorado Boulder, which is just at the base of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and this is in the traditional territories, unceded territories of, of the Ute, Arapaho and, and Cheyenne. Um, and the state bird here is the lark bunting, which is known for its bluish gray beak, uh, it's quite distinctive. So that's a, a little bit of a sense of, of where I am joining you from today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So the, the digital blues beyond the B of RGB and the C of CMYK. Uh, but before turning to my arts practice fully, I wanted to start with just a reference to um, NEST Studio for the Arts, Nature, Environment, Science and Technology Studio for the Arts, which I, I co-founded with a colleague of mine, Tara Knight, who's with us today actually, um, and is a Associate Professor in Critical Media Practices at CU Boulder. And she and I were both really interested in thinking about how to cross over the methodologies between the arts and the sciences and erase some of those blur some of those boundaries at least. Um, I just wanted to mention that and then also another project at, at CU Boulder right now that I'm co-facilitating, which is a Mellon grant um, that, that looks at environmental futures from perspectives, indigenous perspectives um, and, and really examines environmental racism uh, and, and thinks about non-apocalyptic -apoc visions of the future. So if anybody wants to return to those thoughts or, or ideas in conversation at the end in Q&A, I, I wanted to put those forward now, but those kind of some of the things I wear in an academic hat um, as opposed to my, my artistic side. So, um, 
In trying to think about what to share with you today uh, and attempting to cross these digital divides, I wanted to offer you a, uh, a kind of citational map, a little bit of a, a guide, um, kind of bibliographic guide almost in, ter in terms of where I'm thinking. Uh, and to start us off with that, I wanted to, to begin with Fred Moten's book in the break, uh, Aesthetics of the Black Radical Tradition. And Fred, as many of you know, actually taught at Duke for several years. Um, and one of the iterations of the class that I taught with Tom, we co-taught with Laura Harris, Fred's spouse um, at, the, at the Nasher. Um, but uh, one of the reasons I wanted to start with this particular book is that there's a chapter in here that Fred has called The Sentimental Avant-Garde. And uh, he dives into the work, the musician of, of Duke Ellington, whom I kind of secretly like to think Duke University was named after. When it made the switch in 1924 um, from Trinity College to Duke. It was the same year that Duke Ellington came out with no less than, than eight records. Um, so maybe Duke has a, a little bit of, of Duke Ellington in it. Um, that's my historical imaginary at least. But, but in this chapter on the sentimental avant-garde, uh, Fred Moten um, also talks about improvisation. He talks about Freud, Billy Strayhorn, uh, Beaufort Delaney's paintings as music. Uh, um, but what I wanted to do is, was quote him here. Where do words go? Are they the inadequate and residual traces of a ritual performance that is lost in the absence of recording? Where do words go? The picture is text. The image is writing. Quote. So in my time at Duke, I made the film called The Lanthanide Series. It was a 70 minute film, which it's intimately connected to words and recordings, absences uh, and rituals of looking within a set rectangular frame. And, and it also addresses the idea of the imperfections of recording itself. And it's important to me in my practice in that it was the first film or piece that I made that was fully digital. I did rely on some archival footage that I got from, from Skip down the road at AV Geeks in Raleigh, which is a great resource for those of you who, who might be interested in some archival footage. Um, but I, I was really disillusioned in this race that felt like a technological race for ever more pixels, the 2K, 4K, 6K, um, attempt at hyper clarity that actually felt quite disruptive to me. And uh, I, I wanted something that wasn't quite as, as glossy and, and didn't reveal quite as many details. So I, I turned to the digital, but, I, but I, what I did was, was shoot in reflection, as, as many of you know. Um, but I also was thinking about the digital and examining it from, from a kind of material perspective. How did it work? How did differ exactly from analog? What was the material essence of it? So the film looks at the geopolitical and environmental effects of, of mining rare earth elements. Uh, it also looks at the history of mirrors, um, uh, ranging from ancient Aztec obsidian to defunct iPads. Um, another aspect of it, though, which I, I want to highlight today is that it looked at the cinematic subjugation of the natural world. Um, let me show you a clip that's, that speaks to this. And in, in my ongoing interest in the other than human, some would say more than human, uh, because it's seeded so much of, of my subsequent research. Okay, so I, I shot that up the road um, and uh, at the North Carolina Zoo with the help of, the, of Duke's amazing evolutionary anthropology department. Um, and I, I think it, as that clip highlights, uh, our encounters with the natural world have become increasingly mediated, uh, particularly by cameras and the moving image and our, and our experiences of nature in cinema 
have led us really to alter our expectations of reality, of, of what we expect to see when we, we go out into our backyards or go out um, into the so-called wilderness. So I think, I think some of those ideas um, about wildlife on screen, ecological disruption have, have crossed over many bodies of my work. Um, but I'm also interested in, in habitat destruction and ecological grief, thinking increasingly about, about melancholia and environmental justice, uh, including environmental racism and the ramifications of, of that racism in conversations of, of overpopulation uh, of human populations. Also, is it also around species centrism and the overvaluing at some points of scientific knowledge and at other points, um, the undervaluing of it in our society. Um, but finally, again, in the context of this, this talk, how and why materiality, especially digital materiality, uh, matters in our in our conversations. I don't I don't mean to give kind of a litany of talking points here, but um, what I want to emphasize is that what I like to attempt to do in my filmmaking is, is try and grapple with the complexity of the age that we're living in. Um, and whatever you know, name you want to give it, the capitalocene, the thulocene, the kind of colonial anthropocene, I'm currently in favor of the age of acceleration. Um, but this is what I'm, I'm focusing on. And I want to find ways in the documentary arts to, to really acknowledge that, that level of complexity and the various entanglements we find ourselves in. So to enter into this conversation, I want to start us off here with the blue screen of death. I came across this Atlantic article by Evan Meany, who teaches not too far away at the University of South Carolina. He's a gaming artist and scholar. Um, and in this, he, he argues that, that the blue screen of death has been falsely demonized that in fact blue acts as our shield. It's, it's a little bit of an intermediary. It can step in and pause things for us and allow us um, space to, to reflect on, on the vastness of technology and stop us from perhaps going too far, making too many mistakes and having our computer overheat or whatever might, whatever might ensue. Um, so I became really interested in, in the blue screen, the blue screen of death and, and what this does um, to us physiologically to, to kind of one encounter digital light, specifically blue light, um, but, but also think about the, the difference between emitted and projected light, how that affects how often we blink, how it affects the amount of information we absorb um, or how we respond to, to a particular piece. So the first film that I made after leaving my Duke family, um, geographically at least, uh, explored blue light. And this carried over from the Lanthanide series uh, in, in two ways. So one, I'd been really interested in the materiality of um, of color and the way that that was conveyed in say CRT televisions, uh, europium in particular was being mined at the mountain pass mine. That was an image I showed you at, at the beginning when I mentioned the lanthanide series, but europium gives us this wonderful vibrant red. Um, cerium gives us green. So I was interested in, in that from the lanthanide series, but also, I had stumbled upon the fact that uh, that Apple is just maniacal in its trademarking, and it had actually trademarked the word retina. And you can see in this image that I, I was using um, retinal surgeries as one of the elements of my my visuals for this for this blue film that um, I ended up calling a net to catch the light because I couldn't call it technically if I was not going to go against Apple's. Um, trademark, I could not have called it retina. So instead, um, I called it a, a net to catch the light. And it, it takes its name from, from the Mandarin, um, which I can loosely translate from the pictographic of the Mandarin as a net um, to catch uh, the light. So I also, within this film, um, used, I did use some, some 16 millimeter footage uh, that I shot actually using HiCon given to me by Josh Gibson. Um, there in North Carolina uh, that I had hand processed and um, really thought about what in fact could be brought forward in my digital rephotography, kind of an optical printing of, of this, um, of the 16 millimeter footage. Uh, I was also responding to a Wallace Stevens poem called Tattoo, in which he says um, the 
light is um, like a spider and it crawls into your eyelids and, and spins its web. So I was really thinking what it meant to bring the natural world from this analog space into the digital. What happens? Um, and ultimately, I think what happens is it becomes deanimated. <laughs> you lose the animation of it. And I played with this and tried to, in fact, extract frames and see what the minimal um, kind of amount that I could retain the sense of having this, this spider spinning its its prey, its fly prey into silk. What was the minimum amount I could have? And as I played around with it, it turned out to be about frame, five frames per second. Um, I, there were two sonic elements that I was, I was really working with here too in balancing the digital and the natural worlds. So with the digital world, I, I ended up piecing together all of the Mac startup sounds that created a little bit of a chorus um, of that dun 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 kind of coming through and then also using a, a found sound of Steve Jobs from 1984 in Colorado in Aspen giving a talk about the future of the computer as he saw it in, in 1984. So I mixed that uh, computerized version of, of the world with, um, with field recordings of a spider. It was actually a different species of spider, not this orb weaver. weaver. Very few fighter, spiders actually vocalize, but there is one um, gladiosa glucosa that uses vibrations to communicate. And so I used that as another element of, of um, creating my, my sound design there. Um, but really I, I was trying to think about how can I depict landscape on screen? How can I depict non-human animals on screen? You know, it's kind of painful for me as an amazing an experience it was to see those chimpanzees at the North Carolina Zoo and go behind the scenes and see them interact with those those computer screens and have some intellectual engagement. It it's still quite painful um, to see that to see them to know that they had no consent um, and really what comes out for me most are the the bars of the cage. So as I was thinking about. Um, you know, how to depict individuality of non-human animals. Uh, I wanted to, I really wanted to think about that in, in this film. Um, but again, what I ultimately landed upon was this kind of sense of, of de-animating that happens. And my attempt at, at foregrounding that became one, one element of this piece. Um, okay, I want to I want to switch back to my citational pathway and map here, and um, and reference another another Duke uh, faculty member, Nathaniel Mackey, and his book um, Blue Fossa, which um, is a wonderful, just an incredible book of poetry, uh, which looks at two related Black traditions. So the the Fossa comes from from Ghana, um, and in in Mackey's introduction, he has this quote that the Fasa was a group wandering with mournful songs of the last Wagadu all over West Africa. And then he combine, combines that with the blue from Blue Basa, which is uh, the trumpeter Kenny Dorham's um, music. And then there's another incredible quote here in the introduction that Mackie gives that I wanted to, to revisit today in his description of, of what the blues are. So he says, the blues involve, quote, disruption and displacement, valorizing while evincing an absorption and a creative digestion of dislocation, the tradition of durability. So when, when Ted first wrote to me about this talk, he indicated that, that part of the reason for, for having it was to lift everybody's mood and spirit and dispel, if you will, a uh, kind of general sense that we all have it of, of isolation in this particular time of COVID. So, so you're probably rightly asking why this talk is about the blues. Um, but my answer would be that, that we really need to acknowledge and consider the state that we're all in um, before we can really assess it. And, and I think Mackie offers us a blueprint for, for how to embrace dislocation and, and then call upon traditions of durability. So he also writes in, in this book that if we can't do this as performers, then we should do it as listeners. 
poet Maggie Nelson wrote this book between 2003 and 2006, and she wrote it initially in blue ink to, to echo and remind us of, of the poet, or really remind herself of the poet John Keats, who wrote that all words uh, are, are written in water, which is a different motif, I think, of Fred Moten's Where Do Words Go? Um, but Nelson numbers her 240 doc, uh, fragments of pieces in here, which she actually, she calls, um, she calls them uh, propositions and she's echoing Wittgenstein uh, and his, his remarks on color in that. But let me read you number 156. Nelson writes, quote, why is the sky blue? It's a fair enough question and one I have learned the answer to several times. Yet every time I try to explain it to someone or remember it myself, it eludes me. And now I like to remember the question alone as it reminds me that my mind is essentially a sieve and that I am mortal. Um, but Rebecca Solnit comes back to the same question of, of why the sky is blue. And she gives us a kind of more, um, concrete answer. Uh, she says, quote, the world is blue at its edges and in its depths. This blue is the light that got lost. Light at the blue end of the spectrum does not travel the whole distance from the sun to us. It disperses among the molecules of the air. It scatters in water, quote. So um, she's thinking about dispersion of light. Obviously, all light is really dispersed white light, but, but blue light is bent at, at a greater angle. And there's some incredible um, properties that, that come out because of that. So for instance, it, it means that it's very rare in the natural world, um, beyond, you know, pigmentation, that kind of thing. It's, it's, quite, it's quite rare. Um, things like morpho butterflies or jay feathers are actually making use of that, that extreme bending of light. Um, rather than rather than actually creating some some blue pigment, um, but the rarity of the color blue in the natural world, I think, has has um, perhaps because of that made it um, culturally really important, um, essential to art making, um, to cultural identities, and so it's it's. There's, I think we're having something of a, a blue zeitgeist at the moment, um, and I wanted to think just kind of remind us that we can think about this um, you know, scientifically, kind of really from a material perspective or a chemical perspective, um, but ultimately uh, from, a, from a digital perspective. And I wanted to, to circle to the idea now of thinking about the way that the color blue has replaced the color green um, in the humanities and the ecologies, thinking about what is vulnerable about our planet. You know, the idea of Greenpeace and the green movement really um, was pervasive in uh, the 60s and 70s. And it's just recently that we've kind of shifted to this idea of, of the blue humanities. And this was pioneered by, by the scholar Stacey Alemo, taken up by a Duke alum, um, Melody Geo, just recently in Wild Blue Media, which was published by Duke University Press. Um, but thinking about evolving responses to uh, really growing urgencies in our in our need to see how the earth is changing, blue planet, of course. And I think there's all really can can find its roots in um, in Carl Sagan's book and vision of, of the earth as the pale blue dot. Here's the original image of, of the pale blue dot. But ultimately what Sagan reminds us of and that we're constantly thinking of, I think, in terms of the color blue is, is our own mortality. So for that, I really have to turn to Derek Jarman, um, incredible author, artist, filmmaker, um, in his film, Blue, from from 1993. For those of you who aren't familiar with Jarman, he was losing his sight uh, from complications with AIDS when he made the film Blue. He could still see little flashes of blue. Um, in fact, in this book, he talks about how his retina was peeling away from his body, um, but but that these flashes of, of blue could, could come in. Um, and he'd, he'd actually, even before that, been really entranced with um, with the history of blue, the pigments um, that are associated with blue, spe specifically uh, um, International Klein Blue, IKB, um, and that that pigment. Um, here's a here's an image of an installation of of it. 
But what's incredible about the film is it's it's entirely blue. The whole film uh, is is blue. The entire the entire piece. But what happens is that everyone's own eyes and bodies start to have their own relationship with with this color, and we start to white balance. It's our natural kind of state of our our eyes to do that white balancing and floaters and little phosphines start to go off and you have your own kind of cinematic experience in in your eyes themselves there's a curator at, at tate britain who in 2013 his name's andrew wilson wrote that the film is like an elegiac journey towards a zone of immateriality so thinking about blue from a bodily perspective, it can be a symptom. Um, according to a recent New York New Yorker article, some doctors actually um, during COVID had to make really painful, awful uh, determinations about who was most in need of their care based on how blue they were, which of course has, has racial implications there. Um, but blue can indicate asphyxiation. Um, and the, the blue death was actually a colloquial name, as you can see in this image here, for cholera, because those patients uh, turned blue, gray, or purple from, from rapid dehydration. So on these notes of blue, I also wanted to suggest a second imaginary revisionism of the Duke narrative, um, the Duke Ellington University. I wanted to mention that the mascot, uh, which you guys all know as the Blue Devils, um, according to institutional records, comes from the French military of World War I, um, the Diables Blue. These were really kind, kind officers um, who wore blue uniforms, were revered. And again, in the, in the kind of remaking of Duke University in the 20s, um, everybody knew this term. And so it became kind of taken up as, as the mascot. But in my rewriting, I would offer a, a longer history that goes back to the, the 1600s. Hundreds. Um, and this is a time when Blue Devils referred actually to visual hallucinations with people who were suffering from withdrawal from alcohol. Um, those were the Blue Devils that would come up and you would start to hallucinate and, and see things. And that may have paved the way for the idea of, of the blues as a kind of sadness. Um, the first person to write about this was actually uh, a young black woman, Charlotte Fortin, who, who wrote about this in the mid 1800s in her diary. And that, that may be the first link between sadness um, or kind of melancholia and, and the blues. Um, so, so returning to, to my blue film, I just, I wanted to kind of think further about about death and the so-called death of cinema, which I don't I don't believe in, but but many people, you know, thinking about how how film was killed by the digital. Um, so thinking about how this light in particular affects us bodily, I I started thinking about other ways that colors were were affecting us, digital colors in particular. So when I finished the the blue film, I started thinking about about green um, and the RGB, uh, red, green, blue, and and that our current digital recombinatorial process for making colors on a screen that emits light. So pure blue in the RGB color space tabulates as zero red, um, zero green, 255 blue. And there's a slightly different tabulation in the, in the hexadecimal uh, color coding system. But for a computer screen to be fully blue on an HD monitor, that's every pixel, two million of them, um, would be set to those digits, zero green, zero red, 255 blue, RGB. Um, so in my most recent film in the series, my red film, which I am um, called Heart Radical 61, I used a microscope to look at digital color. So let me just show you a little clip from, from that. Xiao means little. So when you put your heart, or I guess when you contract your heart, means you're a little worried and so it actually it means be careful. Du ji or ji, it's a self on top of the heart. So when someone is thinking only about oneself, then that person is jealous. We put ourselves in the middle and our heart is only filling with one's own feeling can't think about other people. 
Okay, so in that, um, you're just hearing a little bit of the audio clip. It gets a little, um, well, complex, I guess, in, in terms of, um, of how the audio builds. But, but that clip was from uh, a woman, a friend who was born in China, spent 10 years in the U.S., and then uh, is, now, is now based in, in France and Switzerland. Um, so in some ways, it, the film is addressing identity and identity divisions and senses of place and belonging. Um, but it's also it's also thinking about um, language divisions and the ways in which that um, that can kind of separate people and place. Um, but it's allowed me to continue this this uh, exploration that I started in in Annette to Catch the Light of of Mandarin and specifically portions of um, radicals. So this is just a, a close up here of the radical chart and 61 you can see in the center there um, is, is the heart radical. So these radicals are placed in larger uh, characters of Mandarin but, but have these, these other meanings to them. And um, the film relies, that film Heart Radical 61 relies on a couple of, of um, interactions with scientists that I wanted to talk about. One is with a heart biologist who studies the fatty tissue on, on non-human animal hearts. And the other um, interaction I had for the making of the film was with a computer scientist who was working with pixel algorithms and, and created a software system for randomizing color, color pixels for me um, to create, say, for instance, this still image from the film where I was bringing out the the red um, and and randomizing uh, with uh, a generative move towards towards the red um, color spectrum. So so focusing on uh, RGB really allowed me uh, an avenue, a way to incorporate some some other studies that are being done on on the effects of that wavelengths of various wavelengths of light are having on our body. So for instance, red light therapy has become quite common um, for treating scar tissue, uh, for treating wrinkles, um, and green light has become um, common for, for treating pain, notably migraine headaches. Um, I'm not gonna go fully into my green film, although at the end of this, I'll, I'll put in a link to an interview that I did uh, actually with, with Carl Sagan uh, and Lynn Margulis's son, Dorian Sagan, about the film, which delves into um, mitochondria and microbiomes and embedded viruses and, and shared selves, essentially. Um, and I will say that Inside the Shared Life is, is my translation of the pictographic Mandarin for, for endosymbiosis. Um, so returning to that idea of, of the subjugation of the natural world, I just wanted to reference uh, an earlier film that I know some of you have seen, um, or it's a trilogy of films, True Life Adventure, where I used found sound from, from early Disney wildlife films to, to look at, at the natural world. Um, but part of the reason I wanted to, to mention it is that um, it had a lot to do with my in interest in, in insects. Uh, and um, coming back also to, to the effects that the blue light has on us, one, one of the effects is circadian rhythm changes, which is why the craze for, for blue blocking glasses and, and computer screens, et cetera. Um, but it also has the ability to kill and mutate cells, specifically insect cells. And it's not clear whether it has the same effect on, on human cells or not. But, but insect cells are certainly affected and can be, and be killed. Um, so thinking about, for me, thinking about insects as these sacrificial and neglected species group um, has become a way for me to really engage with the conversations around, um, around changing environment. Um, this has roots in Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Um, and also a variety of different things. Uh, one of my earlier films was also about colony collapse in, in honeybees. So the entomological has long been a place, I think, uh, where indicator species for us also are kind of memento mori, um, alerting us to ecological dangers, maybe more so than the kind of traditional um, canary in the coal mine. Um, 
but they don't have the same effects like those chimpanzees of, of being filmed. They may not be able to offer consent either, but, um, but individually, collectively, and on a larger ecosystemic level, they, they really don't have, um, there, there's not much effect in, in filming them. And they have this incredible diversity and almost more than any other group of animals in terms of color and shape and dimension and behavior. So I really, um, yeah, like, like having them on screen. So let me show you a little clip of a, another fairly recent film of mine from 2019 called Tenebria Molitor. It's a species of um, the darkling beetle that, uh, that actually has these, these larvae that are, are farmed. This is um, a farm, it's called a micro ranch in Denver where they, where they farm these mealworms. So the film also has a series of uh, styrofoam landscapes, and you may have been able to discern from, from the soundtrack there that I was using a contact mic on various surfaces of styrofoam to, to generate my, my sounds there in opposition to my usual field recordings that like to rely on things like snapping shrimp or bat echolocation in the case of lanthanide series. Um, but for this, it felt really important to me to highlight the sounds of the styrofoam, which actually this particular species of mealworm is capable of digesting and breaking down. So Tenebria molitor, the genus species name, actually translates into violent death spirits for Tenebrio, and molitor is miller, or the breaker down, you know, breaking down of, of, um, of material in the world. And the fact that this, this species can digest styrofoam with, with the help of their microbiome um, is, is pretty incredible and something I wanted to, I wanted to highlight. Um, so coming back to color, I, I wanted to give you another quote from Rem Koolhaas in 1999. He wrote, we have increasingly been exposed to luminous color as the virtual rapidly invaded our conscious experience. Color on TV, video, computers, movies, all potentially quote, enhanced and therefore more intense, more fantastic, more glamorous than any real color on real surfaces. Color, paint, coatings in comparison somehow became matte and dull. It's only logical that with the incredible sensorial onslaught that bombards us each day and the artificial intensities that we encounter in the virtual world, the nature of color should change. No longer just a thin layer of change, but something that genuinely alters perception, end quote. So today, I think our perceptions of our planet are such that because of, of the moving image, we have these expectations to be, to be dazzled. We look to narrators for answers and we're prepared to be immersed in documentaries that allow us a window into hard to reach habitats. But we don't often consider how long it took to capture a shot, how many people were employed, how many animals were disturbed, how many people were flown around the world and an extraordinary labor and environmental cost of capture, what's left out of the frame um, in terms of degraded um, wildlife urban interfaces um, and and how many people will now try perhaps to go and access those really beautiful um, places um, or or try and have some of those species as pets so this is this is really carbon intensive and ecologically damaging infrastructure that has been built through the cinematic industry and it's often forgotten so in my filmmaking I'm, I'm trying to think about those ramifications of, of showing showing um, depicting and, and filming and what my process is I also just want to briefly mention you know the idea of CGI and computer generated images 
which I think have um, some interesting aspects. One is that they they might be more detrimental to our sense of connection, to the urgency of diversity and conservation. Because what I'm again going back to the cool house quote: Why should we protect something when it looks so shiny and bright, and it's even more wonderful in CGI rendering, and, and we don't need to see um, what what's being changed or what's being lost. Um, but but then again, CGI in some cases might allow for a gentler environmental footprint. So what are what are the ethics of that um, in terms of making, and what would what's going to have the most deleterious effect, um, and what would perhaps increase our empathy even more? Um, let me show you just a, a little clip of a film I made last year. It was 10 years in the making. It's very different from my other films, although I'm showing you a section that is perhaps not as different than some of my films. But it, it followed um, eight women who lived up in a, live up at an ashram, and they've lived there since the 1970s. Um, it's just outside of Boulder. Their guru died in 2001, but they've continued to stay on and, and care for the land that, that they have there. Um, so it's really a portrait of these women. In. This was a film that I made for them, but this is a little section that, that is of uh, a Stellar's J. So I am trying to think about the digital wounds. I liked that term that, that Rick used a couple of weeks ago in his talk um, here in the same platform. How can we think about repairing some of these digital wounds and, and what role do filmmakers have, have in that? Um, coming back to the idea of the kind of collective blues, I wanted to, to mention um, this author, Anne Skvetkovich, who's an affect queer theorist, and, and she's really thinking about public depression and how this ties into longer histories of, of violence tied to colonialism and capitalism, but, but how we have this intense collective sadness from, from multiple losses around us, um, these various blues. And as I come to a finish here, I wanted to mention the, the show at the New Museum right now, Grief and Grievance, Art and Mourning in America. Um, about this particular show, the critic Peter Sheldahl wrote, quote, there's grief, which is constant, grievance, which appeals however futilely to some or another authority able and willing to right wrongs, and mourning, the fate and recourse of the irreparably wounded, end quote. And in this show, I wanna emphasize one work in particular um, by Glenn Ligon. It's seen outside here on the face of the new museum in neon. I should mention too that Ligon curated an exhibit in 2017 that was called Blue Black and included more than 50 works, including um, Carrie Mae Weems's Blue Black Boy from 1997. But, but in this work, Ligon's work, um, which is called A Small Band, he was influenced by the Harlem Six and Steve Reich's composition Come Out, which you uses a line of testimony from, from a boy, Daniel Ham, and it's a repetition about, about a bruise and how he has to open it up to show that he will bleed, and that's the proof of, of him being beaten. Um, and of that, Ligon said, quote, Reich makes a tape loop of Ham's voice repeating over and over again. It took me a long time to realize this, but when Daniel Ham said those words, he makes a slip of the tongue. He says blues blood instead of bruise blood. That slip up is really interesting if you think about the blues in the way writer Ralph Ellison thought about it. He says that the blues is personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. 
Blues have always had trauma and tragedy in them, but also something of moving on, moving out, getting away. Quote. So I, I'm trying to think about the blue zeitgeist here at the moment, and I think it really relates to these ideas of, of public depression, of these larger traumas on, on Black lives that matter, uh, pressure on blue uniforms of police officers, degradation of the loss of oceans uh, as a space for re reflection, and, and traumas on the planet as a whole. And there are these collective, if unequal, strains on all of our, our psyches. So we are all mortal, we are disrupted, we are displaced unequally, um, but truly. But we have the capacity, uh, as Nate Mackey tells us, uh, to creatively digest the di dislocation. And there are traditions, notably black and indigenous traditions of durability that can really offer us ways forward, if not as performers, then as listeners. And if not in words or in slip ups of words, then in unrecorded rituals and connections. Sometimes the words can be found in images. So I'm going to end with one silent minute uh, from a current unfinished film of mine about cyanobacteria. That's the C, the cyan, and CMYK. Um, and this is another species that uh, offers offers, I think, a, a, an infinite, for, for me at least, an infinite space for reflection. Um, cyanobacteria are responsible for our current atmosphere, for all the complex life on this blue planet, and, and they also offer us a glimmer of hope in their capacity to, to capture carbon and produce um, more life-giving oxygen, so some clean air for us. Here it goes. Thank you guys so much. I'm happy to take any questions, hear thoughts. Anybody got questions? I'm, I know you do. <laughs> Ted said you could put them in the chat. You can, uh, yeah, you can either bark them out or put them in the chat. Oh yeah, bark them out if you're, if you're willing. <laughs> Is it okay if I jump in? Yeah. Yes, hey, Aaron. Hi, Lisa. Did you see? <laughs> I do. I think I'm, I'm thrilled to see that there, but I talk about that later. But um, <laughs> I'm just I'm just curious. Um, that last image you showed was just so beautiful. I'm, I'm wondering if you um, want to share what's 
going on behind the, the image generation in that last image. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's been really fun. Um, I'm actually in kind of a residency, so to speak, with this biochemistry lab on campus. I met the, the PI of the lab a year and a half ago. Uh, Jeff Cameron, and he has actually been called the James Cameron of, of uh, generating uh, cyanobacteria images, which is maybe a compliment in some worlds. Um, but he, uh, yeah, he heard that I, that I was interested in science and cinema, and so he showed me some, just some videos that he was using in his lab to um, to study single cell growth of cyanobacteria and gene expression. And he said, you know, I just, I think it would be really neat if we could make some images together. And so I said, oh, yes, please. That's my dream. That is my absolute dream. So um, yeah, I've been working with grad students and, and also a lab tech to actually pick different species of cyanobacteria, seed them, grow them, and then they have this incredible camera set up where uh, I can use a joystick essentially to frame up different points on the on the microscope uh, or on the plate of uh, where the cyanobacteria are growing in this single layer. And I can frame it up, I can pick up to 12, and then the camera can is automated. And so for up to two weeks, I can take an image every 10 seconds, every 20 seconds. Um, and it's actually generating new data for the lab that they had never intended, which is, is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. They'd never had really long running images. They just had these short bursts that were showing gene expression. And I said, well, what I really want is, an, is, a, is a video that would go on for a couple of minutes, but that literally is a couple of weeks of growth. Mm -hmm. And they had never attempted that. And it's really expensive for their lab to have that kind of priority uh, on one plate. So anyway, that's just a little bit of a story. But it's incredible too how different the different species of cyanobacteria look. So I, I'm excited as the piece gets longer and longer. It's starting to maybe be in the feature realm. Wow. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll that's see great. if that works or not. Um, good to see everybody. Thanks for your thank yous and hellos. Um, yeah, any other questions or So what, back to Lisa's question, what, how, about how long was that capture going on? Was that a couple of weeks or a couple of that days? That one was about a week. About yeah. A week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what starts to happen that's pretty cool is as it even gets bigger, um, the cyanobacteria are producing oxygen, which is actually toxic to them. So again, this is one of the reasons why I'm so interested in this particular species, because they recapitulate the history of humans in some ways too, with the great oxygenation event a couple million years, a couple billion years ago, they killed themselves off to a certain extent because they of the byproducts that they were making, oxygen, which was good for good for us to evolve, but not so good for that species. Um, so these waves of oxygen that they build up, bubbles of oxygen on the plate, actually kill them um, if they go to, if they grow for too long. Mm -hmm. And, and they also get more, cyan. It, the longer we watch the bluer and the more cyan, do they eventually just congeal into one big cyanotype? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they do. They fill the whole screen. And then if they get that dense, they actually kill themselves off. Okay. Um, but, you know, this is- this No is, metaphor there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. This is false color. You know, I mean, I can manipulate the color here. Yeah, right. It's all false color here. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> blue songs are like tattoos. <laughs> that was Joni Mitchell's blue. I like that one. Other comments, questions? Pedro's here. <laughs> You're muted, though. 
Well, I don't want to do what, what you're supposed to learn in grad school, which is to talk about something you don't know anything about, <laughs> uh, because I unfortunately had a time conflict, so I missed your presentation. But I, I'm just listening, and otherwise I would certainly have questions if I had seen what you presented. But I'll catch up on the recording later, but good to see you. Anyway. It's good to see you. Thanks for coming. Sorry to put you on the spot, Pedro. <laughs> So, Aaron, can you talk a little bit about Nest? I mean, not, you know, just, I don't know, you don't, you don't have to go into great detail, but I'm curious how, how it operates day to day. Yeah, well, we have, um, we have a couple of people on staff. We have an amazing um, person, Joanne Guillory, who kind of deals with all the logistics, which I'm really grateful for. And then um, Tara Knight and myself, and then um, Jorge Pere Gallego, who's an astrophysicist PhD with an MFA in design. Um, the three of us kind of are, are working with graduate students and thinking about exhibitions and, uh, and kind of how we can help get more students in the arts and the sciences to, to work together and ideally more faculty. Um, so yeah, it's interesting since I've been here, I thought initially that undergraduates would be the primary focus, but it turns out that graduate students, as you guys all know, are probably the most um, motivated, the most frugal, able to do the most with the least amount of money and, um, and most productive. So more so than faculty, more so than undergrads, it's really been the graduate students who, who have taken the idea of NEST and helped us really launch it. Uh, so we give summer fellowships, $10,000 uh, to a duo of artists, scientists, using those terms really loosely to, to make work. And then the work that comes out of that, um, you know, thinking about how to, how to exhibit it becomes really critical. So we just finished an exhibition down in Denver at Union Hall, which is in Union Station. Um, the heart of heart of downtown Denver. We had a group of artists in there. Um, and I was just talking to someone at the Denver Botanic Gardens uh, to think about how to have some shows there. So part of it is also just kind of how do we get things off the CU campus and into the, the larger community. Um, but but also how do we within the university break down some of the barriers uh, in disciplines and just allow people to to make work. Um, oh, thanks for for sharing that, Raquel. Uh, the Otago list. Yeah. Oh, I was going to let me give you guys the the links to. Um, Ted shared the one about Nest. I'll share another Nest site and then the Environmental Futures site and um, and then that interview I mentioned on Vdrome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, you know, it's hard to find the right balance between um, how much time to, to put into things, but I definitely have, have found Nest to be really rewarding uh, in meeting new people on campus and, and learning about what other people are, are working on. Mm -hmm. And I'm always, that's for me, that's, I, I enjoy that aspect of it, of kind of making connections and just learning, learning as I go about what cool things people are, are studying. And do the, you all don't have your own exhibition site, you exhibit other places. Well, we do have a small, we do have a small site. And so actually Lourdes uh, um, is, is designing uh, an exhibition for the spring in that space. Okay. okay. Um, so he and uh, another graduate student, Nima, are, are moving some of the space that they have Lisa's piece in right now to the Nest site to try and take advantage of it. But obviously during COVID times, it's a little, it's been really tricky for everything on campus of how to, how to stay open and how, what we can exhibit and how many people come through. Yeah. Great. Have you, I said I wouldn't talk, but here I go, you know, <laughs> have you done exchanges with other universities? Because like a few years ago, um, the, you know, with George Mason, there was this potential idea of like having their graduate program and RMFA, you know, like mm -hmm. often the hardest time for students is right when they're done, you know, to have professional exhibitions and opportunities. So have you done something like that with NAS? I mean, it seems early, but it, if it could be something that that's worth, you know, thinking about. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. No, we haven't done anything formal, but we have we have had some conversations. Um, we've the kind of I guess most formal partnership we've had with, is with the Imagine Science Film Festival in New York, and that we've had some exchanges there. But there are there are so many incredible organizations that are doing the similar work with the art science crossover, uh, and trying to tag into those is has been interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say something? Please. Hey. Um, you know, the your talk is was amazing. It was so good to hear and to feel, and not only to feel all of the things that were talked about, but to feel through the way that you talked about them. And I think um, part of I mean, part of what happens normally at any given talk is it takes a long time to process, which is like what we're experiencing. But I think on Zoom especially, and especially with this collective uh, depression, collective blues that we're experiencing, uh, very topical. Um, I think it becomes harder um, even for those of us who are you know, often speaking up after talks to have productive things to say or to ask, maybe not to say, maybe to say as well as to ask. Um, and, you know, all this is to say <laughs> that, um, you know, like I'm most struck by like how you're weaving things together so magnificently. Like a series of work has always been strung together. Um, but how you were able to um, connect the dots in my life through your talk. And I think that it's felt for everybody. Um, cool. And so I just wanted to thank you for that. Thanks, Anna. I mean, one question, it's an easy, I mean, it's a question I sort of, uh, I couldn't answer for you, but talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the importance in your work, I don't like to say in your practice, so I didn't say it. <laughs> in, in your work um, of of reading, of literature, of you know, of you know, not just poetry with the with the big P, but with the little little <laughs> one as well. Yeah, that's an impossibly big question in some right. ways. Yeah, it's infused. It's just, it's, it's part of everything I feel like I'm doing. Um, and it's where I look to when I'm making work or thinking about making work or have finished making work and need, uh, need something else to, to feed me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, again, I, going back to Fred Moten's book, um, right. in the break, I just, there's no real distinction, right, between painting and music and images and words at some level, right? Of course there is, but um, but they just, they all feed us and the ways in which they, they do that um, can, can take us in different directions. So yeah, I, I find myself always kind of moving back and forth between that, the word and the, and the sound and mm -hmm. the image and how they, the interplay between those. And it feels like kind of like a dance or a, a fight choreo choreography or something where I'm, I go one place and then I, I need a rest from that and I go to the other. Right. I don't know if that makes I mean, sense. I his, his quote and, and we, uh, you know, that what's so interesting is that the way in which you know images are only i'm paraphrasing what he says but it understood by words or they pro they usher in words mm -hmm. and and that words usher in the visual i mean and, and people have argued that nothing's more um visual than audio mm -hmm. which you know is is a total conundrum and 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 a contradiction in in on the surface but but just drive around listening to something that's good, you know, a narrative, and you you just see all of it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, I guess, you know, I'm just, 
it's just an amen corner for the, the idea that, I mean, everything's not the same, but we can't really operate without all of this stuff feeding, you know, sort of looking a little like that last film you showed where everything's sort of merging together um, and forming something large enough to, to exist. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it makes, you know, it sounds simple, <laughs> I guess, but it's not so simple. Because there are a lot of words out there. <laughs> there are. Which ones are you going to use? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's to, it's difficult to, to disentangle that for myself um, because it feels so much a part of the making and then the talking about what was made and then the Mm -hmm. generating of what's coming next um yeah it's all it's kind of all woven in mm -hmm. but um yeah i don't know what else to say about that actually yeah. aaron, i have um Alex. kind of hey aaron uh, tom just made me uh, i'm thinking about among many things after your talk um the idea of research and and you just used the the term like being fed or, or feeding. Um, and with your work, uh, which I find endless, endlessly fascinating, I'm wondering how you think about research as, as, a, as a tool or a term in your, your work and practice, or if that's not a useful way that you think about it, like is, is it just moving through life and being mm -hmm. fed research? And at what point does it lead or, or um, kind of inspire the idea to, to make an object out of out of what you've been fed. I really do like the the term research, but I wonder if it is partly my position in academia and a kind of holding on to that sense of of research and really feeling like that needs to be um, fought for to a certain extent in academic circles because it so often is is held only by the sciences, and I really do believe that that there are discoveries to be made and that research really should apply to the arts in, in all aspects. Um, so yes, I, I, do, I do like that term. I also think about what I do as experimentation and knowledge gained through iteration uh, and experimentation. So that to me is, is our definition of, of research. But then at the same time, as, just as a person, I, I do feel like process and practice and, and the way that one lives one's life should be as integrated as possible. <laughs> and at least for me, that's my, that's kind of my hope is that I can, in my making and in my discoveries, I'm doing what I want to be doing and learning the things and, and feeding the curiosities and um, taking in, absorbing as much as I possibly can, um, meeting as many people that I want to be meeting or hearing what they have to say or reading what they've written, um, whether they're living now or lived 500 years ago. But, but kind of that to me is the, how I want to be living. And therefore, if I can make that my research practice, all the better. Yeah. I'm always trying to figure out the difference between research and just search. <laughs> You're always good at those pithy, pithy <laughs> little maxims, Tom. That's exactly well, it's, your search, your search plan, <laughs> search report. Yeah, I'm on that search, my curiosity quest. Right. Yeah. Do you, Can I ask uh, more? In Portuguese, okay. there's a nice word, which is pesquisa, which is like it, it, it sounds like fishing. You go fishing. Uh -huh. like your, res, your research is your fishing. Mm. I like that. Isn't there David Lynch has his, his book, the Catching the Big Fish. It's all, you, you fish for those ideas and they come to you in your creative space. Mm. Anna, were you going to ask another question? Yeah, I was just going to ask. Um, you said... You said that um, almost maybe feature length for the cyanobacteria film. 
I want to know more and I want to know about sound. I just want to hear more about oh. where this is at. <laughs> that might be too soon to say. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm wanting to go in depth into it. It just it feels like this endless project. I mean, then the variety of the species that we're, we're seeing and filming is incredible. Um, so I don't want to shortchange it. But I'm also, I think, longing for the long form again and what that can offer. I've, I've made so many short films in the last five years, but that's partly out of necessity, maybe partly out of dearth of ideas, but, but partly out of just trying to accommodate a new job and the pressures of academia mm -hmm. and the life of that, that it's, I, I found it hard to really have the space that I, I feel like I need in terms of contemplation to create something that's uh, that's a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. I could I could stare at the cyanobacteria. I could stare at what we just saw endlessly. So yeah, okay. I look forward well, to a big future length. That's reassuring. Okay, mm -hmm. I won't shy away. <laughs> Any other comments or questions for Aaron? Anybody? Well, I don't want to drag out the digital. I know we're all <laughs> in the well, digital world. I'm so grateful to everyone for, for sharing screen time with me. Um, well, and thanks, Sarah. I mean, it's been wonderful. To, it's always wonderful to hear you, but to see this, to see all this um, sort of woven together like, like you did. Is really really insightful, invigorating, um, exciting, and as as Anna just said, that last. I mean, I could watch that. You know, I feel like I, I want to see where they go next. Kind of, like, <laughs> there's a real there's there's a real pull to continue to to observe, and and the idea that there's multiple species that conceivably have different colors and different behaviors is even 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 more interesting. Um, well, so I'm so grateful to you, Tom, for inviting me and Ted for arranging and all of you again for coming. I can't wait to see you all in person somewhere sometime in the not yeah. too distant future, I hope. And I think we should, Pedro's idea of exchange, I think it was, uh, it was more than just a theoretical question, is we should investigate oh, like exchange, yeah, whether the exhibition exchanges or human exchanges or both exchanges all no, no, pre no pressure though, Tom. Dan, you don't want to put Aaron on the spot. There. Well, Aaron, does, it was I mean, a hint. It was. Well, we all. Ought, I mean, we ought to investigate it. It's. A, it's. A, um, we can see what we can do. Um, so no, pr no pressure as to how, what scale, but. Anytime. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you all for your time. That's Best so to David and Darwin. <laughs> Thank you. So good to see you guys. Hope I see you in person soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.